Lesson 12 for June 15 to 21. What have they seen in your house? Read today by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 15. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we live in a world of turmoil, of sin, but a world of your grace, where you are available for each of us each day of our lives. We thank you that as we have been studying these lessons, we can learn more about our relationship with you and with those about us. And as we look at our own homes this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us, bless us, and help us to be the light that you really want us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Let's read that again, First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Perhaps we've reached a stage when, thanks be to the Lord, our lives are, at least for now, going well. Family is fine, work is fine, health and finances are too, or maybe not. Maybe your home for now is in pain, turmoil. Either way, when someone comes to visit your home, like emissaries from Babylon who visited King Hezekiah, what answer could be given to the question that the prophet Isaiah later asked the king, what have they seen in your house? Isaiah 39 verse 4. What have people seen in your house? What have heavenly angels seen? What kind of spirit permeates our residences? Can one smell the scent of prayer? Is there kindness, generosity, love, or tension, anger, resentfulness, bitterness, and discord? Will someone who's there walk away thinking, Jesus is in this home? There are important questions for all of us to ask ourselves regarding the kind of home that we have created. This week, we will look at some of the issues that can make for a wonderful home life, despite the inevitable tensions and struggles that homes today face. Sunday, June 16. Learning from a King's Mistake Question. Read the account of Hezekiah's healing and the visit of the Babylonian ambassadors. Second Chronicles 32, verse 25. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favour shown him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. And verse 31. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him, that he might know all that was in his heart. And Isaiah chapter 38. In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, surely I will add to your days fifteen years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. 
And this is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow of the sundial, which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz, ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees on the dial by which it had gone down. This is the writing of Hezekiah king of Judah, when he had been sick and had recovered from his illness. I said, In the prime of my life I shall go to the gates of Sheol. I am deprived of the remainder of my years, I said. I shall not see Yah, the Lord in the land of the living. I shall observe man no more among the inhabitants of the world. My life span is gone, taken from me like a shepherd's tent. I have cut off my life like a weaver. He cuts me off from the loom. From day until night you make an end of me. I have considered until morning like a lion. So he breaks all my bones. From day until night you make an end of me. Like a crane or a swallow, so I chattered. I mourned like a dove. My eyes fail from looking upward. O Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. What shall I say? He has both spoken to me, and he himself has done it. I shall walk carefully all my years in the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. So you will restore me and make me live. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I have great bitterness. But you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol cannot thank you, death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. The living, the living man, he shall praise you, as I do this day. The Father shall make known your truth to the children. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore we will sing the songs with stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. Now Isaiah had said, Let them take a lump of figs and apply it as a poultice on the boil, and he shall recover. And Hezekiah had said, What is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? And then we read chapter 39 and watch the difference. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and re had recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased with him and showed them the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, and all his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, They came to me from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good, for he said, At least there will be peace and truth in my days. Scripture points out that the messengers were interested in the miraculous recovery of King Hezekiah. However, Hezekiah seems to have been more silent about his healing experience. He didn't emphasize the things that would have opened the hearts of these inquiring ambassadors to the knowledge of the true God. The contrast between his gratitude for being healed in chapter 38 and his silence about it in chapter 39 is striking. God left him to test him. 
This state visit was a most significant occasion, yet there's no record of Hezekiah seeking special guidance about it in prayer, from prophets or from priests, nor did God intervene. Alone, out of the public eye, with no consultation with spiritual advisers, Hezekiah apparently let the word of God in his life and in the life of his nation recede from his mind. The intent of the historian in Second Chronicles 32.31 may have been to show how easily God's blessing can be taken for granted and how prone the recipients of his mercy are to become self-sufficient. Question below are some lessons about faithfulness in home life that can be gleaned from the experience of Hezekiah. What others can you think of? Every visit to the homes of Christians is an opportunity for people to meet followers of Christ. Few visitors are likely to open conversation about spiritual things. Christians must find ways that are sensitive and appropriate to the occasion to share the good news. Christians are not called to show off their material prosperity or accomplishments, though they may recognise these as blessings from God. They are called to, as it says in 1 Peter 2.9, declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light, or to use Hezekiah's experience as a symbol to declare that they were dying, but Christ has healed them. They were dead in sin, and Christ resurrected them and seated them in heavenly places, as we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so, to finish today, in what ways are you able to use your home to witness to others? How could you share your faith in Christ more forthrightly with visitors to your home? Monday, May 17. Family First. The most natural first recipients of our gospel sharing endeavours are the people in our households. There is no more important mission field than this. Question What conclusions can be drawn from John 1 40 to 42 about sharing faith at home? John 1, beginning at verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Also, we're going to look at Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And Ruth 1, verses 14 to 18. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her, and she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. An enthusiastic report. Andrew went beyond mere reporting. He arranged for his brother Simon to meet Jesus. 
an enthusiastic report about Jesus and an introduction to him as a person. What a simple formula for sharing the gospel with relatives in our homes. After the introduction, Andrew stepped back. From then on, Jesus and Peter had a relationship of their own, helping children to find a faith. Children in a home can often be overlooked as fitting recipients of gospel-sharing efforts. Parents mistakenly assume children will simply absorb family spirituality. This must not be taken for granted. While children and young people learn from the modelling they observe, it also is true that these younger members of the Lord's family need individual attention and opportunity to be personally introduced to Him. Deuteronomy 6 is insistent on this point. Attention must be given to the most effective kind of religious education. Regular spiritual habits of personal and family worship are to be encouraged in the home. Time and earnest efforts must be put forth on behalf of children and youth. Question. What can we learn from the evangelistic efforts of Naomi in Ruth 1, 8-22? And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept, and they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, But Ruth clung to her, and she said, Listen, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you, for wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened, when they had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Ruth saw Naomi at the lowest of moments, when she tried to push her daughter and daughter away, and when angry and depressed, she lashed out against God as she recounted her losses in verses 15, 20 and 21. No more eloquent testimony than Ruth's can be given to show that youth can meet and make a commitment to a perfect God, even when introduced to Him by an imperfect parent. And so to finish today, how does the notion of home as the most important mission field affect your attitude toward the people who live with you? Work together as a family to prepare a list of specific efforts your family can make to lead unsaved relatives to Christ.
Tuesday, June 18. Peace that wins. Question, what counsel does the New Testament have for marriages divided by religion? 1 Corinthians 7 verses 12 to 15. But to the rest I, not the Lord, say, If any man has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the believer departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. And First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. The Blessing of Being a Christian Partner in 1 Corinthians, Paul responds to converts' concerns that staying married to an unbelieving spouse might be offensive to God, or bring defilement upon themselves and their children. Not so, says Paul. The sacred state of marriage and its intimacies are to continue after a partner's conversion. The presence of one's Christian partner sanctifies the other partner and the couple's children. The word sanctifies should be understood in the sense that unbelieving spouses come into contact with the blessings of grace through living with their Christian partners. Heart-rending as it is, the unbelieving partner may decide to abandon the marriage. Though consequences will be serious, the merciful word of our God, who always upholds human freedom of choice, is, let him do so. The believer is not bound in such circumstances, 1 Corinthians 7.15. Call to live in peace. The clear preference of the word of God is that despite the challenges of a spiritually divided home, a way might be found for the peace of Christ to reign there. The hope is to keep the marriage intact, to give evidence of the triumph of the gospel in the midst of difficulty, and to promote the comfort of the partner with whom the believer is one flesh, though he or she be unbelieving. Question. What might be the limitations of a spouse's responsibility toward a non-believing partner? Loving-kindness, unwavering fidelity, humble service and winsome witness on the part of the believer create the greatest likelihood of winning the non-Christian spouse. Submission in a Christian marriage arises out of reverence for Christ, as we read in Ephesians 5.21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. When a spouse relates with Christian submission to an unbelieving partner, the first allegiance is always to Christ. Faithfulness to the claims of God on one's life does not require a spouse to suffer abuse at the hands of a violent partner. And so to finish today, is someone in your church struggling with an unbelieving spouse? If so, in what practical ways could you possibly help? Wednesday, June 19. Family life is for sharing. In the following verses, trace the New Testament uses of the word follow or imitate. What do they tell us about the process of becoming a Christian and growing as a Christian? What do you think they suggest about the relationship between modelling and witnessing? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore I urge you, Imitate me. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 6 And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit. 
and Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hebrews 13 verse 7, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And third John verse 11, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. The New Testament emphasis on imitation acknowledges the important role of modelling in the learning process. People tend to become like whom or what they watch. This principle applies to relationships generally and especially in the home, where imitation is common. There, children imitate their parents and siblings. Married partners often imitate one another. This concept provides an important clue to how couples and families can bear Christian witness to other couples and families. The Power of Social Influence We witness from our homes when we provide opportunities for others to observe us and to share in our home experience in some way. Many simply have no good example of marriage or family relationships to follow. In our homes, they may see how the Spirit of Jesus makes a difference. Social influence, wrote Ellen White in Ministry of Healing, page 354, is a wonderful power. We can use it, if we will, as a means of helping those about us. End of quote. As married couples invite other couples for meals, fellowship or Bible study, or when they attend a marital growth program together, the visitors see a model. The display of mutuality, affirmation, communication, conflict resolution and accommodation of differences testifies of family life in Christ. Question. In this context, however, of what must we always be careful. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And John 2.25. And had no need that any one should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Follow believers who follow Christ. All human examples are flawed. However, the witness of the Christian home is not about modelling absolute perfection. The New Testament notion of imitation is a call for individuals to follow believers who follow Christ. The idea is that individuals will grasp Christian faith as they see it demonstrated in the lives of others who are as human and fallible as they are. And so to finish the day, what could you do to make your home a better model for Christian witnessing? Thursday, June 20. Centres of Contagious Friendliness Question. Compare biblical references on hospitality with actual incidents in the homes of several Bible families listed below. First of all, Isaiah 58, verses 6 and 7. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh? And verses 10 to 12. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. 
Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. And Romans chapter 12 verse 13, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality in First Peter 4 and verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Note the attributes of hospitality that are demonstrated. And then we look at Sarah and Abraham in Genesis 18, verses 1 to 8. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, and he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the ground, and said, My Lord, if I have now found favour in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that you may pass by, inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. So... Abraham hurried into the tent of Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So they took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. And then Rebecca and her family in Genesis 24. And first of all, verses 15 to 20. And it happened before he had finished speaking that, behold, Rebecca, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin, no man had known her. And she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, Drink, my lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also, until they have finished drinking. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew for all the camels, all his camels. And verses 31 to 33. And he said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Then the man came to the house, and he unloaded the camels, and provided straw and feed for the camels, and water to wash his feet, and the feet of the men who were with him. Food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told about my errand. And he said, Speak on. And then the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place... He looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He is gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any one by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. Hospitality meets another person's basic need for food, rest and fellowship. It is a tangible expression of self-giving love. Jesus attached theological significance to hospitality when he taught that feeding the hungry and giving drink to the thirsty were acts of service, 
done to him, as we read in Matthew 25, verses 34 to 40. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick, or in prison, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Using one's home for ministry may range from simply inviting neighbours to a meal to the radical hospitality of lending a room to an abuse victim. It may involve simple friendliness or opportunities to offer prayer with someone or the conducting of Bible studies. True hospitality springs from the hearts of those who have been touched by God's love and want to express their love in words and actions. Families sometimes complain that they lack the facilities, the time and or the energy to offer hospitality. Others feel awkward, unskilled and unsure about reaching beyond what is familiar in order to associate with unbelievers. Some wish to avoid the complications to their lives that may arise from becoming involved with others. Many contemporary families confuse hospitality with entertaining. So to finish the day, in what ways does your home life reflect your own spiritual condition? Friday, June 21. The Power of the Home in Evangelism. From the book Ministry of Healing, page 352 and 355, we read, Far more powerful than any sermon that can be preached is the influence of a true home upon human hearts and lives. Our severe of influence may seem narrow, our ability small, our opportunities few, our acquirements limited. Yet wonderful possibilities are ours through a faithful use of the opportunities of our own homes. End of quote. And that brings us to our discussion questions. And today there are four. One, ask anyone in class if it were the influence of someone's home that helped them to make a decision for Christ. Discuss just what it was that made such an impression. What can the class learn from that experience? Two, In what practical ways can you, as a class, minister to a family with an unbelieving spouse? 3. As a class, talk about some of the pressures in the home that work against faith. Write up a list of some of these things, then across from them, write down possible solutions. 4. The private lives of Christians are a means of witness to children, unbelieving spouses, other relatives and visitors. While faith sharing at home may not always be as complete as one would like or result in the conversion of relatives and visitors, imperfect family members seek to point the way to a perfect Saviour. Through generous hospitality expressed in the Saviour's name, they bring within the realm of grace all whose lives they touch. Think about the influence of your home on those who come to visit. What could you do to make it a better witness of faith for all who step within your doors? Inside Story Praising God with HIV, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Maria Samo has HIV and is praising God. 
Samo was born into a Seventh-day Adventist family in the village of Nicodala in Mozambique, and she got baptised at the age of seven. Her village had no high school, so she moved to Quillamain, a 30-minute drive to the south, to continue her studies. There she made new friends who introduced her to alcohol and tobacco. Samo's parents didn't know that she smoked and drank until after she got married. Her father came to visit one day and walked in as Samo was smoking. He didn't say a word, but guilt washed over Samo and she resolved never to smoke or drink again. Quitting smoking proved easy, but drinking was much more difficult for Samo. She prayed for help. God answered in an unusual way, she said. She began to suffer severe panic attacks. Fearing that she would die, Samo's husband took her to South Africa for medical treatment. A South African physician warned that she would die in three months if she didn't give up drinking. Samo quit with the help of a 45-day rehab program and, returning to Mozambique, reconsecrated her life to Jesus. Then her husband died. Six years later, she received the shocking news that he had been infected with HIV and passed on the virus to her. From that time, she said with a smile, I have been praising the Lord. The reason is because she feels healthier than at any time in her life. My health is better than it was before I contracted the virus and my conscience is clear, she said. Today, Samo, a grandmother of four, works as a trader, buying gold and precious stones in various villages and selling them in Nampula, Mozambique's third largest city. But her passion is encouraging others with HIV. Many people lose hope when they learn that they are infected, she said. They don't have anyone to talk to, and they die. She said Adventists should have a special burden to reach out to those with HIV, praying with them and encouraging them. I share the hope that I have in Jesus and his soon coming, she said. And there's a photograph here of Samo, who has a beautiful smile, who looks very healthy, and is beside the street uh, in the city where she works. Part of the first quarter 2018 13th Sabbath offering went to open an orphanage for children who have lost their parents to HIV and AIDS in Nampula. Thank you for your mission offering. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide by Dr. Percy Harold from Queensland, Australia. This service is brought to you by Hope Channel, the Sabbath School Department and Christian Services for the Blind. Remember, God is always faithful.